The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. A student wants to register for a conference. Listen to the conversation between the student and the woman and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Look at the registration form. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good morning. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes. Is this where we register for the Beyond 2000 conference? Yes. What's your name and I'll get your conference bag. Well, I haven't actually registered yet. I was told I'd be able to register today, so I hope that's OK. I've just arrived in Melbourne. That should be fine if you're a student. I'll need to take your details, though. So, can I have your full name? Yes, sure. It's Melanie Mitchell. Is that M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L? -L? Yes, that's right. And that's Ms, not Miss. OK, fair enough. And what's your address, Melanie? I live in student accommodation at Sydney University, so my address there is Room 66, Women's College, Newtown. OK. And which faculty are you studying in? I'm in the Faculty of Education. I'm doing a Master's in Primary School Teaching. Right. And may I see your student card because I need to verify that you're a current student? Yes, sure. Here it is. My number is 994-578-ED. The woman asks the student some more questions about the conference. Look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 5 to 10. OK. Now, do you want to attend all three days? The conference runs from Thursday to Saturday. Yes, I think so, if I can afford it. What does it cost? Well, you're eligible for a student discount, which makes it $15 for a day registration or $40 for the three days, though it is possible to register for half a day only. I'll register for all three days, please. Good. Now, will you be requiring accommodation while you're here in Melbourne? Yes, I suppose I will. What's available? Well, we have several levels of accommodation. You can share a room with another student for $25 a night. Hmm. Or you can have your own room but share the bathroom. I believe it's just down the corridor. That's $45. Right. Or you can have a single room with your own bathroom. I don't mind sharing a room. On second thoughts, yes, I do. I'll have my own room, but I'll share the bathroom. Right. Now, the conference fee does not include meals, though you do get tea and coffee in the breaks. Shall I put you down for lunch? That's an extra $10 a day. And there's the conference dinner on Friday night, which is $25. Oh, and what about breakfast? <laughs> Hang on a minute. It's all starting to sound rather expensive. Um, I'll have the lunch, but not the dinner or breakfast, if that's OK. Perfectly OK. Now, a couple of other things. 
There are a number of special interest groups organised. They're known as SIGs, and you're asked to nominate your preference. They'll take place on the Friday afternoon and Saturday morning, but they're filling up quickly, which is why you need to nominate now. Right. What are the SIGs? Well, there are six altogether. Let's see. On Friday, you have a choice between computers in education or teaching reading skills. Hmm. Or a session on catering for the gifted child. Oh, they all sound interesting. But technology in the classroom is really my area of interest, rather than reading. So I'll go for that. I can probably read up on the gifted child topic myself. Right. And then the Saturday options are a session on cultural differences, or there's music in the primary curriculum, or you could go to the one on gender issues in the classroom. Wow. Can I go to them all? They all sound fascinating. Afraid not. Well, I'm really interested in how boys and girls behave differently, even when they are very young. So I'd better opt for the third session, even though the cultural differences sig is probably really interesting too. Right. And the music option would be interesting. And how would you like to pay? We accept most credit cards or bank checks, but not personal checks. I'm afraid. Been caught out too often before, and cash, of course. We never say no to cash. I'll have to put it on my card because I don't have enough cash on me right now. That's fine. Enjoy your time here with us in Melbourne. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a lecture on deep sea exploration. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully. Good evening. My talk this evening will cover three main themes. First, I'll outline a timeline of how deep sea exploration vessels developed. Secondly, I'll describe the most recent of these, the deep sea Challenger. And finally, I'll look at some of the benefits of this deep sea research. Okay. To start with. Let's look at how underwater exploration vehicles have developed over the years. The first manned deep sea exploration vessel was invented in the 1920s. It was called a bathysphere, better known as a diving bell. It was basically a round metal structure with windows with just enough room for two men to sit in, and it was lowered into the ocean on a cable. The first descent in the diving bell. Took place in 1930, and in 1934 it went down to a depth of nearly a thousand meters, which was impressive for the time. The problem with the diving bell was that it had no power of its own, and there wasn't much room for the researchers to move around. So, the next development after the diving bell was the bathyscaphe, a small manned submarine invented in the 1940s. The difference between the two was that the bathyscaphe had its own power source, which allowed the scientists to investigate in the depths of the ocean more freely. A bathyscaphe called the Trieste reached a record depth of ten thousand meters in 1960. Since then, a new record has been set by James Cameron, who descended to a depth of eleven thousand meters for the first time in 2012.
Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. So let's move on now to look at the submarine that took James Cameron so far down into the ocean. If you look at the drawing of the Challenger, you can see the pilot's chamber at the very bottom of the submarine. It's a very small section where the pilot sits and controls the sub and all the equipment on it. Now let's have a look at how the submarine is powered. Going up from the pilot's chamber, in the middle of the sub, on the right-hand side of the drawing, you can see a whole section covered in batteries. They provide the power source that takes the sub all the way to the bottom of the ocean and back up to the surface again. Next to that, there's another important part of the sub. Um, you probably realise that there's no light at the bottom of the ocean, so the sub needs to take its own. If you look at the back of the sub, in the middle, just next to the batteries, you can see the panel of lights. They provide the light for filming and taking samples from the seabed. And one more part of the sub, which is important for navigation and to stop it spinning out of control, is the large fin at the back. You can see it at the back of the sub, at the top of the drawing. OK. To conclude my talk, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. First. What is the purpose of this deep-sea exploration? And second, is it worth the expense? I think one of the justifications for spending so much money on this kind of research is that it allows scientists to understand more about the surface of the Earth. For example, how it was formed and how it behaves. This could have important consequences for predicting earthquakes and saving lives through early warning systems. Another reason this type of research is considered valuable is that by exploring unknown parts of the ocean, we increase our knowledge of the availability of minerals for industry. And obviously, this could lead to huge commercial advantages. So, the answer is yes. In the long run, this kind of exploration can benefit both the ordinary population and industry. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear part of a lecture about psychology. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. In this lecture, I want to introduce you to the life and work of a famous psychologist, a psychologist who had a big influence on the field of social psychology. Social psychology deals with group behaviour and the individual as a member of a group, and Solomon Ash made a most important contribution. Solomon Ash worked mostly in the USA, but he was born in 1907 in Poland, and he came to the US when he was 13. He went to an ordinary high school, and as he had an interest in human behaviour, he decided to study psychology. 
He was quite disappointed with his first acquaintance with psychology. It seemed to be all about rats and mice, and that didn't interest him at all. However, he persevered and eventually became a professor of psychology. Now, the experiment which made his name is called the line judgment task. Participants were asked to compare some simple lines. More precisely, they were given a card with three lines, then were asked to compare another single line and say whether it was longer or shorter than the lines on the card. What a participant didn't know was that in reality all the other participants were effectively actors. That is, they were instructed to give a wrong judgment and the purpose of the experiment was to see how the single subject would react. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Listen to the second part of the talk. The subject would hear the others saying things about the length of the line which were clearly false. Most subjects answered correctly, in spite of the incorrect judgments of the others. But a proportion, 32%, conformed to the majority view, the incorrect view. This proportion was much, much higher than anticipated. Before the experiments, they'd thought 15% or lower might do this. To give you a bit more detail, I have an illustration up here on the board. A group of six or seven people were given a card with three lines on it. There is a short vertical line, on the right of which is a longer line, and on the right of that, there is another still longer line. However, it's clear that the longest line is the right-hand one, the second longest, the middle one, and the shortest is the one on the left. The participants were given a second card with just one line on it. I should add that in these experiments people became very distressed. They found it very hard to deal with a situation where people were telling them things which were against the evidence of their own eyes. One woman became extremely agitated, running about measuring and looking and checking and shouting in a kind of massive anxiety. Now. What experiments which occurred some time later found was that other factors can influence the result. For example, when there were more so-called participants, there was even more conformity. On the other hand, when people were able to respond in secrecy, by writing the result down, for instance, they made fewer incorrect judgments about the lines. Subjects gave various explanations for why they made the decisions they did. Although they weren't put under pressure by the experimenter, many felt that they would somehow spoil the experiment and upset the person running it if they didn't agree, no matter how stupid they felt. More simply, in other cases, they said they just wanted to not show themselves in a bad light. Whatever the reason, Ash's experiment has had a long history, and although... Incredibly... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a presentation by a student about a website she has designed for a supermarket. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 113 and 114.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. For my website design project, I decided to approach SuperSave supermarkets because I have an evening job at the supermarket, so I already have a slight insight into their organisational goals and workings. The field research for my project was in two stages. First, I had an interview with Mr Dunn, who is in charge of SuperSave's customer care department. I discussed the project with him in order to identify the supermarket's requirements. Mr Dunn said customers are often unwilling to make a face-to-face -face complaint when they've experienced difficulties with a product or a member of staff or anything related to the supermarket. So he said a website which allowed members of the public to get in touch with the organisation and bring the problem to their attention in a private manner might be very useful. And we agreed that I'd work on this. For the second stage of my research, I devised a questionnaire to put to SuperSave customers. I needed to find out about the customers' experiences of problems together with their attitudes towards making complaints, both directly and indirectly. I used a mixture of closed questions, such as Have you ever experienced a problem at any SuperSave store? and open questions such as what would you find helpful about a customer complaint website. I decided to do interviews rather than rely on distribution of the questionnaire as I felt this was likely to lead to a higher take-up rate. I visited four super safe stores, two in the city centre and two in the outskirts and altogether I interviewed 101 respondents. Then finally I analysed the results. I found the results of the questionnaires to be very informative. I found that out of the total number of customers investigated, 64% had at some stage encountered a problem in a super safe store. Out of these people, the vast majority said that they hadn't reported the problem to any member of staff, they just kept it to themselves. The next thing I tried to find out was why they hadn't complained. Well, about 25% of the people I interviewed said the reason was that they couldn't be bothered and a slightly smaller percentage said that they didn't have enough time. But 55% said the reason was that they felt intimidated. I finally asked if they would be more likely to complain if they didn't have to do it face to face and nearly everyone I asked said that they would, 95% to be exact. I then set about designing the website to meet these needs. Once I'd completed the website, I made another appointment with Mr Dunn to find out what he thought of it. Mr Dunn said he felt that the pages would benefit his organisation by giving customers a new way of expressing their complaints and by making it easier to collect complaints, identify specific places where service and customer care were not as good as they should be and act upon them accordingly. SuperSave is already a highly customer-orientated organisation and he thought our website would be an excellent addition to their customer care effort. This is all well and good, but there still remains the general problem with websites, that there's a lack of access to online computers. Surprisingly, in my survey, I found that 88% of those interviewed had access to the internet, which I felt was quite high. But this access wasn't always direct. For some people, it was through their children and grandchildren and neighbours and so on, rather than being readily available in their own homes. This could prove to be a major drawback to the site, but it is still better to have it now to get the edge over competitors, however slight, and in the very near future, it is expected that almost everyone will have direct access to the internet. Another thing to consider is that at the moment I can only base our conclusions on data gathered from a tiny fraction of the supermarket's customer base. In order to get a better idea of how the site is doing and to see how well I have met my objectives, the site will need to have been up and running for at least a few months. After this time, it'll be possible to see whether or not people are actually using the site and if it's helping to make improvements to their customer service. 
It would also be interesting to study the effect of the site on staff at the supermarket. Morale could be dented as more complaints come in. Staff may feel they are being unfairly criticised and that there is no need for another way for customers to complain. But also, the site could boost morale by making staff come together to overcome the constructive criticism and they may gain more job satisfaction by knowing that they are making a difference to the customer. So, overall, I feel my website has met my objectives, but there is scope for improvement and expansion. Are there any questions? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.